Welcome to the TLPCA presentation covering one coat stucco. Course number is TLPCA 01. In association with AIA best practices, our provider number is 502-111-291. All attendance will be reported to AIA CES by the provider within 10 business days of the presentation. Certificates of completion may be obtained by request from the provider. Attendees must sign in with their name and AIA member number for course attendance to be reported by the provider. During the presentation of this course, you will be introduced to the history, components, and methods of application for One Coat Stucco. General questions are encouraged if this is a live presentation. However, please save any product-specific spe questions for the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Learning Objectives We will learn the history of conventional and one-coat stucco. We will identify required and optional components of the wall system. We will familiarize you with required application of metal lab substrate for one-coat stucco. And we will also teach you how to select the right application method and finish for a specific project. Criteria for stucco is as follows. Conventional three-coat stucco is governed by ASTM C926. One-coat stucco is not governed by any ASTM standards, but only by the ICC ES report. ICC ES reports are specific to the manufacturer which has obtained them. ICC ES reports may only be obtained after extensive wall assembly tests have been performed and received an acceptable result. Following guidelines in ICC ES reports and ASTM C1063 apply equally to architects, general contractors, as well as the plaster contractors. Stucco is one of the oldest crafts in the world. Mud huts were made of limbs and twigs and then filled in with mud as a form of insulation. Egyptian pyramids were stone then covered with a blend of gypsum, lime, and sand. Mayans used a very similar material for their pyramids in South America. The Greeks invented the slaking process, which was burning rock to transform it to lime and then grinding it into a powder. This powder was mixed with water and covered and then left to hydrate for several months or even years. These are examples of mud huts from around the world. The mud hut on the left is an African mud hut with a thatched roof. The one on the right is a Native American mud hut with a dome roof and a hole in the center so smoke from their fire could escape. Native Americans made blocks out of clay, straw, water, and other earthy materials and laid these blocks out in the sun to bake and harden. Then these blocks were laid in a running bond or brick type pattern using the same material in a thinner form as a mortar. After these blocks were laid, they would use a similar material to the mortar and plaster over the blocks with a scratch coat and then what, what is very similar to a brown coat to make the material smooth. The brown coat would not get as hard as a cement product, so in the photo on the right you can see that there is some erosion involved. This is the main building of an Indian Pueblo in New Mexico. The Indian tribe pays to have this building resurfaced every year to keep it looking nice. There are many other buildings on the property, however each family is responsible for resurfacing their own portion of the building every year. On the right is a photo of the Egyptian pyramids, what they look like today. On the left is a photo of what they were believed to have looked like at the completion of their construction approximately 4,500 years ago. This is a photo of a Mayan pyramid the plaster on this one seems to not be as eroded as much as the Egyptian pyramids. We attribute this to the fact that the Mayans are not in a desert. They don't have the high winds and sand blowing against the plaster as an abrasive. The Romans discovered pozzolana. This was a volcanic ash combined with lime putty. This created a moisture-resistant cement known as Roman concrete or opus cementitium. Examples of this product's use was on the Colosseum, the Forum, and the Roman bathhouses.
One coat stucco was first attempted in the early 1970s out of necessity. Contractors could not do conventional stucco quickly enough to keep up with the residential demand and budgets. Many people attempted field mix formulas, which usually failed. Bill Nichols, who many consider as the godfather of one coat stucco, developed a pre-blended product that only added sand and water on the job site. Mr. Nichols obtained an ICBO report with a one hour firewall assembly rating. We will discuss different sheathing options, correct and effective flashing details, weather barrier selection, optional drainage materials, Sheathing options are as follows. Tongue and Groove Foam Insulation Board is an excellent sheathing option. It has a nominal density of 1.5 pounds per cubic foot and is manufactured to the standard of ASTM C578. Foam insulation board may be EPS, expanded polystyrene, or XPS, extruded polystyrene, depending on the manufacturer's ICCES report. When used as a sheathing, foam insulation board has a minimum thickness of 1 inch. Our value of EPS is 4.6 per inch. It adds insulation and also aids in sound suppression. Any foam sheathing board used must be recognized in a current ICC ES report. When installed as a sheathing, the tongue should face upward, grooves should face downward, to create a shingle pattern to aid in watershed for incidental moisture. The weather resistive barrier shall always go behind the foam per AC11 testing. Foam insulation board may also be installed over rigid sheathing or open studs. When installed over rigid sheathing, square edge foam board may be used. Foam insulation board is not required with one coat stucco, but may be used as an alternate or additional component. When foam insulation board is used, it provides continuous insulation to aid in meeting your IECC guidelines. The next sheathing option we have available is wood-based structural panels. The minimum thickness for plywood or OSB is 5 16 of an inch when studs are 16 inches on center. When framing members are 24 inches on center, plywood is required to be 3 8 of an inch thick OSB shall be 7 16 of an inch thick. Any wood-based structural panels used must be exposure one. All wood-based structural panels should be installed horizontally in a running bond pattern in accordance with the APA engineered wood construction guide. They should have 1 8 of an inch spacing at all panel edges and ends to accommodate expansion in material due to humidity or incidental moisture. They shall be fastened every 6 inches to the framing member at the perimeter and every 12 inches at any intermediate supports. Gypsum sheathing is also an acceptable sheathing option. Standard gypsum sheathing must comply with ASTM C36 or C1396 and water resistant core treated gypsum must comply with ASTM C79 or C1396. Glass mat gypsum sheathing must comply with ASTM C1177. Here we will discuss flashing. Proper flashing can be a very valuable asset. Improper flashing can be a very costly liability. We will discuss ways to treat rough openings. We will discuss roof areas and diverters. We will also go over window heads and sill pan flashing. We will show you some details on how to deal with wall penetrations and we will discuss the need for membranes, rigid, or both styles of flashing. On the left, you see a rough opening that has been flashed with a fluid applied system. This system has a fabric embedded into the rolled on material. On the right, you see a rough opening being flashed with sheet goods and a peel and stick style membrane. The detail on the right shows a diverter also known as a kickout flashing. This piece of flashing is required where you have a roof rake that terminates and a stucco wall that continues. Without this flashing, water shedding down the roof could potentially run behind the stucco and cause water damage to everything below it. The detail in the middle shows a roof area with stucco above that has been counter flashed. A cutaway detail on the right 
also shows this same counter flashing method. A one by material is fastened to the wall where the wall meets the roof. Step flashing is then installed from the roof to the one by material. A Z flashing is installed behind the plaster, across the one by material, and down over the step flashing. This allows you to change out your roof or flashing if necessary without tearing up any stucco. The detail on the left demonstrates window head flashing. This prevents any moisture that may be behind the cladding from going into the window frame. This also allows any moisture to drain and escape and not run farther down the wall. The photo on the right shows a sill pan flashing. Any moisture that may come in and run down the sides of the rough opening has an escape route before it can get into the stucco below. Wall penetrations can come in many forms. These can be wires, hoses, pipes, etc. This is a two-piece component with a U cutout. The first piece is installed and they apply sealant over the top of the pipe. The second piece is installed and then you may also apply sealant again. After that, you use a taping method where you start at the bottom, then you run tape down the sides and tape across the top and this creates a shingle pattern with the tape as well as any sheet goods you may be using. This is a saddle flashing. This would be where you have a parapet wall dying into a stucco wall. This prevents any incidental moisture from getting into that corner. However, keep in mind that the stucco on the wall that the parapet is terminating into will have components around the saddle flashing. These components should be fastened and the fasteners should be set into a bead of sealant to prevent any incidental moisture. Now we'll discuss flashing, the need for membranes, rigid, or both. Membranes simply protect behind the claddings as a secondary backup to rigid flashing. They are functional, but definitely not aesthetically pleasing. However, they are very flexible and easy to install. Rigid flashing is usually exposed to the view. It provides an escape route for incidental moisture and is excellent for transitions to dissimilar materials. Rigid flashing can be incorporated into aesthetic design. Examples of this would be using copper flashing exposed to the view to add to the beauty of the building. The first weather barrier option we will discuss will be fluid applied weather barriers. These are very easy to install and can be rolled or sprayed. They are very flexible, have a reduced risk of tearing as they become one with the substrate which they have been applied to. They may also help reduce energy cost as some are an air barrier as well as a weather barrier. Most are vapor permeable. You should check with your manufacturer to ensure this before you specify it on a project. Fluid applied weather barriers provide seamless encapsulation. Therefore, improper lapping of sheet goods would not be an issue if you used a fluid applied. Any fluid applied weather barriers used with stucco or one coat stucco will require a slip sheet of paper to break the bond and create a drainage plane. Fluid applied weather barriers are first installed over the joints embedding a fabric or mesh. They should also be installed over the rough openings prior to the windows or doors going in and many manufacturers have preformed pieces for corners on windows and doors. After the joints have been treated, you may come back and apply the fluid applied weather barrier with a sprayer, roller, or brush. Different manufacturers have different wet mill thicknesses they require for their products. Some require one coat, some require multiple coats. Please check this with the manufacturer of the fluid applied weather barrier that you're using. The project on the right is almost ready to receive a slip sheet and then its lath substrate. Other weather barrier options are paper products or sheet goods. These require a minimum of two layers. This could be an olefin type paper or other 60 minute paper with one layer of grade D as a slip sheet. Two layers of grade D is the minimum requirement. All sheet goods must be overlapped in a shingle pattern to encourage drainage away from the substrate. Overlaps should be two inches horizontally and six inches vertically. Some manufacturers require tape on their joints. Please check with the manufacturer of the weather barrier you're using. Sheet goods can be incorporated with membranes around rough openings. Paper-backed lath may also be used for the second layer. 
However, sheet goods are subject to tears from fasteners and high winds. On the left, we see an applicator who has applied his one layer of olefin paper and coming back with his one layer of grade D as a slip sheet. He has cut the olefin paper that wrapped into the rough opening and wrapped it over the top of the grade D slip sheet to encourage drainage in a shingle pattern. On the right, we see a structure that has two layers of grade D paper and is ready for the lab application. Here we will discuss optional drainage materials. These are available from a quarter inch to three quarters of an inch in thickness. They are made of entangled web to create a three-dimensional drainage plane. They are installed over paper or foam plastic insulation directly behind the lab. Most have a sacrificial layer that qualifies as a second layer of building paper when the first layer is 60 minute or greater. Grade D paper would not qualify for this. If the cladding is left open at the top, incidental moisture may drain out the bottom and the opening at the top allows for convection drying. Drainage materials are installed in the same shingle pattern as building papers. They allow an approximately 90% of moisture to drain immediately. Remaining moisture will drain shortly thereafter by drainage and or convection. On the left you see how the drainage material comes in a roll, just like many sheet goods. On the right you see an installation of drainage material in a shingle pattern starting at the bottom, working their way to the top, and the lath will go directly over this. Here's an example of a project where lath is going directly over the drainage material. No foam insulation board is being used. Here we will discuss lath options. Expanded diamond mesh lath must be compliant with ASTM C847. All lath must be installed in compliance with ASTM C1063. Lath shall be fastened every six inches through the sheathing and into a framing member. Lath is typically made out of galvanized steel. Lath must be a minimum of 2.5 per square yard in compliance with ASTM C847. All lath must be furred. Most lath sold today is self-furring. Corrosion-resistant zinc or plastic accessories should be used in coastal areas. Lath shall never span breaks in construction. This would be an example if you have a block wall meeting up with a framed wall. There should be a true expansion joint there and the lath should never span that break. Always check with local building officials about the need for inspections during the installation process. Some jurisdictions require inspections by third parties. This is a photo of self-furring expanded diamond mesh lath that has been applied to a wall. Notice the dimples in the lath. These are what fur the lath away from the wall to allow the plaster to key behind the lath. Other lath options would be woven and welded wire. Welded wire must be manufactured to ASTM C933. Woven wire should be manufactured to ASTM C1032. Any woven or welded wire must be recognized by an ICC ES report obtained by the manufacturer. Woven and welded wire are very easy to install as they come in rolls and they are simply rolled out from one end of the wall to the next. Installation of woven and welded wire still follows ASTM C1063. The photo on the left shows woven wire. The red area of the woven wire is where it has been crimped to fur itself away from the wall. The photo on the right shows welded wire and you can see where this wire is also crimped to hold the lath away from the wall to allow the plaster to key in. There are many accessories that go along with metal lath. These accessories provide grounds for plaster thickness, create clean terminations. They are foundation weep screed, plaster stop, also known as casing bead or J-mold, corner beads, control joints, expansion joints, and aluminum reveals. Please keep in mind that aluminum reveals do not qualify as control or expansion joints because they are rigid and do not allow for any movement. The part shown here is foundation weep screed, sometimes called number seven weep screed. This provides a clean termination at the bottom of a stucco wall above earth grade or concrete. This part also allows incidental moisture to drain. Many people believe the holes 
in the foundation weep screed or where the moisture drains. This is incorrect. The holes are for the plaster to key into. The stucco shrinks when it cures and develops a tiny crack between the stucco and the foundation weep screed. That is where the water drains. Foundation weep screed must be installed to conform with building code. This part may not be replaced by casing bead or casing bead with weep holes. It is available from 3 8 to 7 8 of an inch. However, larger parts are available to be custom made for projects with foam insulation behind the stucco cladding. The nose of the foundation weep screed should be 1 inch below where the framing meets the foundation. Please keep in mind that plaster contractors do not cover, govern where final grade is placed. It should be 4 inches above soil and 2 inches above concrete. This is the responsibility of the architect and the general contractor as well as the plaster contractor. Our next part to discuss is number 66 expanded flange casing bead. Common names for this are 66 casing bead plaster stop or J mold. This is used to terminate stucco to dissimilar materials. Casing beads are available with or without weep holes from 3 8 inch to half inch for one coat stucco and larger for conventional stucco. Custom parts may also be made to fit one coat or conventional stucco with foam insulation behind the cladding. This part may not be used to replace foundation weep screed. Casing bead can be doubled back to back to create an expansion joint, however this must be caulked. Corner beads are a vital part of any stucco assembly. They provide grounds for straight outside corners. They are available in many different styles. Wire corners are available in short flange, arch, bull nose, or a combination of any of the three. The photo on the left is a wire corner. This is the most versatile corner available for stucco assemblies. It can be arched, bull nose, or both. The photo in the center is a 1A corner. This is a very rigid corner. The photo on the right is a 2A corner. It is almost identical to the 1A corner However, it has a reinforced nailing flange. Other lath accessories are control joints and expansion joints. However, these are not the same. Control joints allow minimal movement at the joint. Control joints help contain any cracking to a specific wall panel. Expansion joints allow panels to move independently of adjacent panels. Expansion joints go through the sheathing all the way to the framing. Expansion joints must be a two-piece component to function properly. Expansion joints can be assembled by butting two pieces of casing bead back to back, but this application must be caulked. Horizontal joints should butt to continuous vertical joints. Good practice is to install membranes behind any expansion joints and leave a little extra material in there to accommodate structural movement. Examples of control joints are the number 15 double V control joint, or the XJ double J control joint. Both are acceptable. Number 38 zinc control joint is also acceptable. And on the right, you see number 40, which is a two piece expansion joint. This part allows for movement up, down, side to side, and in and out. Plaster sand is a critical part of any stucco assembly. Sand must meet ASTM C144 or C897. If these sands are not readily available, Local sand proven to have worked for previous stucco applications is acceptable. Sand must be clean and free of loam, clay, silt, soluble salts, and any other organic matter. Improper sand may cause issues with performance of one coat stucco. Sand should always be added according to the manufacturer's written instructions. Here you have an applicator who is pumping the material onto the wall directly over the lab. This is a one coat application, so if he is going a half inch, he will spray the material approximately five eighths of an inch thick. Immediately after the material has been sprayed around, other applicators will come in with long straight edges, known as feather edges or rods, to move the material around and somewhat get it on plane. Please note that they are not making the final grade of the material here, they are simply moving it around. After the material has taken up and it has been moved around to fill in holes, they start trimming it. This is known as the back trial method. 
If you'll notice in the photo on the right, you can see the casing bead near the fascia board. The applicator starts trimming near the casing bead to expose it and works his way down. In this photo, you can see the dark areas are the areas that he has worked and the light areas still remain untouched. In the photo on the right, coming off the right edge of the window, there is a vertical control joint. So the applicator works from plaster stop to plaster stop and then down to the control joint using those as a screed for the plane of his plaster. The photo on the left shows the back trial method of trimming. The photo on the right shows the applicator still screeding his walls and the dark areas are the areas that have been touched by the tool. The light areas are low spots that must be filled in. One coat stucco is available as a concentrate or a pre-blended material. Either way, it must be recognized in an ICC ES report. Concentrate material is a factory prepared blend of Portland cement, fibers, and other proprietary additives. Pre-blended material is a factory prepared blend of Portland cement, sand, fibers, and other proprietary additives. Concentrate materials add sand and water at the job site, while pre-blended materials only add water at the job site. Either material must be mixed following the manufacturer's written instructions for mixing. Reviewing. One coat stucco may be pre-blended or concentrate. It must be recognized by a current ICC ES report. One coat stucco must have a one hour firewall assembly rating. One coat stucco is installed three eighths of an inch to a half inch thick. One coat stucco is always installed in accordance with the ICC ES report of the manufacturer. One coat stucco can be hand troweled or machine applied. There are many finish options available for one coat stucco. One coat stucco offers a reduced cost compared to conventional stucco. One coat stucco is a lightweight cladding at approximately four and a half pounds at three eighths of an inch thick and approximately six pounds at a half inch thick. One coat stucco is, however, limited to applications no greater than 40 feet in height. One coat stucco may be applied by hand with a trowel or pumped by a machine. Stucco must be applied with sufficient pressure for the material to key into the lath while it's in its plastic state. Straight edges, such as darbies, feather edges, and slickers should be used to create a uniform thickness and straighten walls. All voids and irregularities should be filled in during this process. Materials should be then floated or trimmed using the back trial method to compact the material and create a uniform surface to receive finish. Walls should be moist cured for a minimum of 48 hours after the initial installation. Moist curing. Stucco should be moist cured for a minimum of 48 hours after application. Walls should be lightly misted, however not saturated. Usually the best time is early in the morning, late in the afternoon, or both. The climate will dictate the timing and the frequency of wetting the surface. Moist curing helps to minimize shrinkage cracking of the stucco. It also helps build maximum strength in the stucco cladding. There are many finish options available for one coat stucco. However, one coat stucco must receive some sort of finish. This could be a bag cement based stucco finish, either colored or gray to be painted by others, acrylic or elastomeric coatings. These must be applied over some sort of a texture finish coat. This may be either a bag cement based finish or simply hand texturing with the same material they used for the one coat stucco. Acrylic textured finishes and elastomeric textured finishes are also valuable finishes used in a one coat stucco system. Texture and color options are limited only by imagination of the designer. Primers are encouraged with coatings, paints, and acrylic or elastomeric finishes. Alkali resistant primers are available and can reduce curing time needed prior to the application of an elastomeric acrylic finish or any type of coating. There are ways to minimize cracks in stucco. Stucco will crack to some degree. Cracks do not necessarily indicate stucco is defective or improperly installed, but that a stress greater than the ability of the cement plaster has been introduced into the cladding. 
These cracks may be contained by control joints to the panels where they reside. No panels should be larger than 144 square feet, longer than 18 feet in any direction, and should not exceed a two and a half to one ratio. However, there may be some exceptions to the rule on this. Control joints should come off of corners of windows and doors vertically to aid in stress points. You may double lap lav on inside corners and cracks may be significantly reduced by overlaying with an acrylic base coat and a fiberglass mesh. However, if you use this system, know that some cracking may still occur. One coat stucco can be used on single family dwellings, multifamily dwellings, mixed use developments, medical buildings, commercial structures, and also in hospitality. That concludes our presentation. Thank you for your time. If this is a live presentation, you may now ask any questions you have. If this is an online presentation, please take the 10 question test at the end to receive your certificate and credit for the course. Thank you.